Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Um, it's weird to see my face so big there. Uh, but good afternoon, good morning, uh, good evening, if there is people joining online. Um, thanks so much for being here, and I hope you're enjoying the IGF so far. Um, my name is Veronica Ferrari. I am Global Policy Advocacy Coordinator at the Association for Progressive Communications. Um, I invite those who are in the room and want to come a bit closer. That's fine. Uh, we are a small group. Um, so the idea is to have a, a conversation and to hear from you also. Um, so quickly, for those who don't know APC, we are an international civil society organization and we are also a network uh, of members from over 40 countries, mostly from the global majority, working for gender, social, and environmental justice and the intersections with in digital technologies. And in today's session, we are going to discuss, as you may know, uh, about gender perspectives in cybersecurity, uh, specifically cybersecurity policy. So we all know that traditionally um, cybersecurity debates were mainly centered on national security, the security of systems, uh, but in recent years, we are seeing an increased conversation um, about the need for a human rights-based approach to cybersecurity, uh, which is an approach that places um, humans at the center since are the ones impacted by cyber threats, cyber operations. Um, and additionally, we see more and more a recognition in international, regional, and, and national spaces about the fact that different social groups are in different positions with dealing with cybersecurity threats such as surveillance, hacking, censorship, um, data breaches, disinformation campaigns, and also shutdowns. Um, and research by the Association for Progressive Communications and others have also shown that cyber incidents disproportionately impact and harms um, individuals, individuals and groups in society on the basis of their gender, but also their sexual orientation, uh, their gender identity or expression, but also because of their race, religion, and their profession, in the cases of journalists, activists, human rights defenders. Um, and in addition, civil society has been documenting and producing research that shows that around the world, legal cyber frameworks are being used to silence and persecute uh, women, LGBTQ people uh, for their, their activism, their gender expression, or, or simply because of expressing dissent. Uh, so these are some of the issues we want to discuss today with all of you. Um, what do we mean by a gender approach to, to cybersecurity? How we can integrate such a perspective um, in, in debates at the national, regional, and international levels? and also how to deal with the challenges uh, when in integrating this perspective. Um, and also it would be great also to discuss what are issues this agenda should focus in the future. Um, so for this, we have great speakers here that will be sharing examples of how cybersecurity directly affects the lives of women and diversities in different regions of the world. Um, they will tell us also what is the status of the integration of gender in national but also international cyber uh, policy debates, among other issues. Um, so, quick intros um, for our great panel. Our first panelist is Kemli Camacho. Um, Kemli is the co-founder and current general coordination coordinator of the Sulawatsu Cooperative in Costa Rica. Um, next, we have Grace Gitaga, CEO and convener of the Kenya ICT Action Network, Kiktanet, uh, which is a multi-stakeholder platform for people and institutions uh, interested and involved in ICT policy and regulation. Uh, also joining is Jasmine Passis from the Foundation for Media Alternatives, where she works on issues related to privacy, data, and cybersecurity. And finally, um, we also welcome David Fer Fairchild, first secretary at the Permanent Mission of Canada. Um, David focuses on digital policy and cybersecurity and represents uh, Canada, for example, at the UN Open Ended Working Group on ICTs. Uh, so, again, thank you all for being here. Um, so, we plan to have a round of interventions from our speakers, and then the idea is to open the floor um, for comments, questions, um, or, or, or any thing you want to bring. Um, and, and my colleague, Pavi, is helping with the engagement of online participants, if we have any people joining online. Um, so, but before we dive into the discussion, I quickly wanted to provide like a, a background of APC's thinking uh, on gender and cybersecurity, and also a bit more about the specific tool we have developed that we have here 
these brochures. Uh, we have copies in English and Spanish, and you can use the QRL, the QR code here to download it. Um, so, firstly, for us, it's important to to note that the gender approach to cybersecurity is not only a women's issue. Uh, that gender goes beyond that, and gender is about power relations. Uh, the idea also that cybersecurity is not only a technical issue. Uh, that technological and also policy solutions can actually contribute or be used to mitigate um, discrimination and inequalities in societies. Um, so for APC, um, a gender approach to cybersecurity is about understanding and addressing differentiated risks and also needs uh, faced by complex subjects. Um, should be explicitly intersectional, so should take into account gender, but together with other intersections and factors uh, that that compose our identities, such as race, ethnicity, religion, class. Um, so cybersecurity is actually responsive to the diverse security priorities, the perceptions and practices of different groups um, and people. Um, our approach also recognizes that we are all active subjects uh, that have agency in the process of creating a more secure environment uh, online for everyone and questions and works to overcome uh, one of the main challenges regarding cybersecurity, which is the lack of intersectional diversity uh, in the tech sector, in the cyber sector, but also in, in cyber diplomacy and cyber policy. So all in all, this perspective means that in every step of the design, implementation, and evaluation of cybersecurity measures and policies, the goal should be to positively impact the greatest number of people in all of the diversity and complexity. Uh, and we, what we argue in this and other publications is that without these more holistic or systemic approaches to cybersecurity, large segments of the population will be vulnerable to cyber attacks, uh, and as a consequence, national security, the security of systems, uh, as well as human rights are affected and weakened. So the framework the, um, that I mentioned before, um, uh, just a quick about that, so basically from our research and an initial mapping that we conducted at APC, um, we found it difficult to find references to gender and gender equality in cyber security policies and strategies around the world. And it was even more challenging to find practical recommendations or guidance on how to incorporate such a perspective into cyber policy. So because of that, we believe it was key to offer a reflection on why it is important to include a gender approach to cyber, but also guidance on how to do it. Um, so in collaboration with cybersecurity and gender specialists, activists, um, and also policymakers, we developed this framework to support, first, mainly policymakers working at the national level in cybersecurity policy. But we also think that this could be a useful tool for civil society when working at the national level, engaging in regional discussions, and also in the international level. And we also think that this could also fit the discussions happening, for example, at the UN on cybersecurity. Uh, so basically, we want to help and support different audiences and groups in different ways. Um, so this framework is made up of an overview. It's a document uh, that compiles norms, standards, uh, and international guidance connected with gender and cybersecurity from Human Rights Council resolutions to ITU guidelines, report of UN processes. Uh, we have another document that maps the existing research addressing gender and cybersecurity that is still scarce, but has been growing in the last uh, years. And also an assessment tool that provides the practical recommendations to develop uh, this gender approach to cybersecurity policy. Um, so as I said, we intend this framework to be useful for different audiences and in different ways. Um, also thinking about the international organizations and the regional organizations that are the ones that provide advice uh, for the development of, of cyber security strategies. So basically this fr framework has been designed um, as a starting point. We acknowledge that the recommendations are general and we need to adapt them to local and national contexts. This is why we have been organizing regional conversations with civil society, with policymakers in regional IGFs. Um, to socialize and also enrich this framework, uh, and we are discussing it now with the IGF community. Um, so I will stop here. Uh, so we we would like to hear from our speakers. Um, Kemli, if that's okay, I will start with you. Um, so Sula Batsu has a lot of experience engaging in cyber policy in Costa Rica, but also in Central America. Um, so I wanted to ask you, what are in your view 
the main issues that a gender perspective on cybersecurity should consider in the region? And also, what do you think is the status of the integration of a gender perspective in cybersecurity policy in Costa Rica and, and, and broader? Uh, so, yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. I can pass you this mic. Okay, you have it there. Thank you, Kemli. Thank you, thank you, Veronica. Thank you uh, for the invitation. Thank you, everybody, for being here. This is, a, I think, a, a really key discussion. Um, I, I decided um, to go to the very practical uh, aspects uh, based in the experience that we have had now for since 2018, working uh, in uh, integrating gender in policies in general and the cyber security strategy in Costa Rica. I'm going to, to try to reflect a little bit and, and get some of the, um, of the good practices and the lesson learned also. Uh, just, just very fast, we, we, were, um, we participate in Costa Rica, we have a policy of gender science and technology, which is uh, the big framework uh, to, to work in, this, in these issues. And we participate very actively in the building of this policy, and then later we were designated to elaborate the monitoring and evaluation framework for the policy. And now, this year, we are designated uh, to begin, when I return, to develop the action plan for the policy of science, gender, uh, of science, uh, technology, and gender in Costa Rica, yes? And also, we are part of the um, uh, national committee as representative of the civil society organization, the national committee for the cybersecurity strategy. Then one thing that, that first here, the, my, my, my first thing is, I don't know in, in all, all your countries we have this strategy, mandatory in Costa Rica, you have to have a committee, a multi-stake uh, committee uh, to develop and to follow up the policies and the strategies. Then we are part of this committee. Um, the first thing that I have to say is, um, um, is budget, budget, where the budget is allocated. I think this is, to be honest, the possibility to do or not to do things, yes, and to define uh, which is the vision of one government, yes, about what you are going to prioritize, and if gender is prioritized, Dice it in the in the um, in the strategy is the budget. Then this is something that that uh, we one of the lesson learned or the thing that we wanted to share. Uh, as B uh, Veronica said before, when we began, we we have two moments in Costa Rica. Costa Rica was hacked as a country in 2020, exactly after the pandemic. Yes, we were hacked. Totally, as a country, yes, uh, held that as banking, that as uh, ev everything was hacked as a country. Then there is a, a, a before and after, after the, uh, for the hacking, yes, um, and also. At the same time of the hacking, we got an authoritarian government, yes, and the other was uh, more open and and. We have hacked and have an authoritarian government, okay? Then um, I wanted to say first that the cybersecurity strategy was totally at the beginning or totally oriented to, to, uh, to attend, to, to take care of the attacks. That, that, that is the cybersecurity policy. I imagine in many of your countries is the same, yes? Nothing more than that, and all the budget was related to, uh, to, to, to react to the cyber. Even with that, we were hacked as a country totally, okay? But when we, when we were hacked, um, um, something very important is because of the country was not prepared, they asked the country, they asked it to the private sector to be in charge of the cyber security of the country, okay? Um, and this is uh, something that continues happen happening, okay? And 
Uh, also, they ask some governments to support the country in the cybersecurity part. Then in this context, we have tried to integrate the gender perspective uh, in the cybersecurity strategy, yes? Then what do we do to try to integrate the, the cybersecurity, uh, the gender in the cybersecurity strategy? One thing that we do was to convene civil society organizations as a network and we, as representative of the civil society organization, we convene a network, or, or a network of organizations that are, were not interested in cybersecurity at all. Uh, organization uh, working with kids and young people, organization working with uh, sexual workers, organization working in environment, or organization working in um, uh, VHS. Uh, organization, LGBT organizations, a, a really a big network of organizations to uh, do the advocacy based in this mo big movement. If not, it's for us impossible <laughs> to integrate a gender perspective in the strategies. One first thing I don't see here, I, I, we participate on that, then uh, it's, it's uh, something for ourselves for also, is something that we, had, we have to do with this organization was um, a training program about what cybersecurity is, yes, and why it's important for organization working in uh, indigenous the aspects, yes, uh, the, the education part about what cybersecurity is using a popular education approach, I think is something that we have to do. For this organization, even more than cybersecurity, they are worried about um, the management of the personal data, yes? And not necessarily, it is connected, but it's not the same. Then uh, I think this is something that we have learned. We have to dedicate almost six months of training programs to really, uh, for the people to understand not only what is cybersecurity, but which is the connection between cybersecurity and sexual workers, for instance, yes? Then this process is, for me, crucial, crucial because because it's the only way to really advocate. We, we believe a lot in the advocacy based in social movements. Then this is one, one point I wanted to, to say. Um, we, we have discussed in, I don't remember in which of the panels, but the, uh, the, the issue of the consultation, because we were consulted by the strategy builders, yes, but this consultation, we participate a lot, we dedicate a lot of time, we did the recommendation, we put, we comment everything, and when the first cybersecurity strategy came out, any of our comments were integrated of the civil society comments. Then this consultation processes also is something that we have to take a lot in count. I'm going to finish very fast. I have other things, but um, I, wanted, I wanted to say that um, after the hacking and uh, the authoritarian co uh, government come, um, we, we, we continue the, the Last uh, cybersecurity strategy, I don't know if that happened in the, your countries, but when the government changed, they trash it, okay? All this process, they trash it, and they begin another process, okay? They begin another process, and then this is something also that we have to take in account when we are working on these issues, because uh, we have to begin again. All the process, all the process, all, all the process of... of um, of the developing the, the, the strategy. Um, something that I wanted to say also is uh, <clears throat> in, the, in the second strategy, a strategy led by the private sector, uh, by the big companies that have their um, headquarters in Costa Rica, my country, um, they are pushing a lot for having more women studying cybersecurity. And this is one of their most important strategies inside the cybersecurity strategy. Women study cybersecurity as the gender focus of the strategy. And of course, 
this is wonderful, more women in IT and all of that, even uh, if this is because of the private sector agenda to cover the deficit of human resources that they don't have at this moment to answer to the, all the, the digital development, yes? And uh, then this part we have to, to take a lot of care because it's not necessarily one uh, aspect uh, related with the gender approach to the uh, cybersecurity strategy. Uh, just two more words for the other. We, we also have this policy, what we could was to integrate in the policy of gender science and technology a big area related with um, violence uh, against women, a big area, a big, uh, a big strategy, yes? And uh, then we could integrate that. And because this is the umbrella, maybe we can take this part to develop the, the strategy. And then we could integrate that. And um, we also uh, could integrate a data monitoring of the gender and, um, and not only women, but gender, yes, data monitoring related with uh, uh, VHS um, work, uh, people or sexual worker, etc. Yes, about the violence against them. Even if we know violence against gender diversity is not. Uh, on the only thing, but those are the issues that at the moment, at this moment, we could integrate based in our practice. Then I leave it there. Okay. Thank you, Kemli. Um, yeah, so many great things that Kemli shared from their experience working at the national and regional level from the need um, of awareness at the very beginning, the need to form coalitions and to be linked also with organizations working on other agendas, not necessarily on, on cybersecurity and gender, but human rights, development, um, children rights more broadly, um, and also the need to think a gender perspective in cyber beyond the idea of diversity and inclusion of more women in ICTs, which I think is, is really important. Um, so I'd like now to turn to Grace. Um, so Grace, you also have... A, extensive experience working in, in cyber security policy at the national, the regional, and also the international levels, uh, but direct work, for example, on cyber capacity building for groups that experience uh, marginalization, such as women, but also persons with disability, persons living in rural areas. So I wanted to ask you about like more the, the intersectional challenges that, for example, policymakers should consider when, when working on cyber security policy, and also how can these policymakers effectively address these intersectional challenges that are about gender, but also about broader inequality issues? Um, so yeah, I would love to hear your thoughts about that. Okay, thanks, Veronica. I think uh, before I, I respond to your question, I just want to say that, uh, that at Kicktonet, uh, we, we, we work on cyber security uh, and cyber hygiene. Um, and that is in line with our mandate um, to, to push or agitate for inclusion of communities in, in ICTs and in whatever uh, that we do. So, for example, we have been working, uh, we have dedicated an entire program on just working with women in all of their diversity. And this has included training women in, 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 uh, in digital security and uh, in cyber hygiene practices um, and just encouraging them to form communities of practice so that they're able to protect each other, especially when they are attacked online and to also to be able to push for their issues uh, so that then they can, uh, they, they, they can get that policy attention. Uh, we also, you know, in terms of also working with other groups like you have raised, we work uh, with uh, persons with disabilities. We've also, you, we also work with farmers. We work with uh, home caregivers, and we also work with youth in the in the informal settlements. Uh, in terms of supporting, um, uh, that, that's our work at um, at national level, and we also sit at the Kenya uh, SAT as the civil society representatives. Um, in terms of regional work, we run what we call Tatua Digital Resilience Center. Tatua, it's Swahili meaning um, 
uh, meaning that um, it will solve, solve. Um, and this is for to support um, social justice organizations, organizations that are working in very um, sensitive issues uh, to basically enhance their digital resilience. And, uh, <clears throat> and then, at, uh, of course, at, uh, internationally, we participate in the open-ended working group just making sure that we are bringing on board the perspectives of of of, of ordinary people in that um, in in those conversations. Now, the question that you have asked me about shaping uh, that um, uh, you know about contributing or what um, policymakers should consider at that intersectionality, I think the first thing that I want to say is that. Um, Cyber security, unless, uh, unlike your other um, uh, uh, policy issues, I think um, you know it's it's a complex it's a complex issue, uh, as it requires a multifaceted um, uh, field that intersects with different uh, stakeholders and different domains, and therefore, uh, because of that, I think uh, policymakers need to consider. Um, certain range of, of intersectional challenges, uh, but I'm just going to highlight three. And one of them uh, that has been drawn from our experience of working with ordinary uh, marginalized communities is on the issue of cyber security awareness. That um, policymakers sometimes will see it and determine what policies need to you know, come in place, but the people who are affected or the people who are part of the perpetrators are not participating in shaping some of these policies. And so there's a, a need to understand um, what informs those who are the perpetrators, but also for ordinary people, do they really understand what cybersecurity is all about? So cybersecurity uh, is very critical, you know, that creation of awareness of the risks um, as well as the best practices is crucial. And therefore policymakers, um, you know, apart from coming up with the policies, there's need for them to, to be at the forefront of supporting um, awareness creation among citizens and among businesses and to support that collaboration between different sectors on on how you know on how to create awareness and how people can position themselves um, in order to benefit from the policies. Uh, the second issue I want to talk about is on human rights. Uh, you know, when we work in civil society, uh, we we work with ordinary people. We work with people who are affected in different ways. And sometimes policymakers, because they are in a position of uh, privilege, they may not understand some of the issues that affect uh, ordinary people. Uh, and therefore, it is important for them you know, you know, to ensure that at, as they come up with the cybersecurity policies, um, that they do not disproportionately uh, impact of vulnerable populations and uh, that there is need to respect those rights as a vital uh, consideration. And when I say about uh, vulnerable you know, populations, it's because there is that element of thinking up here and forgetting that there are people who are affected here and not thinking that the issues of the people down there matter. And finally, uh, when it comes to cybersecurity and policy making, uh, there's the need to consider um, innovation. Um, like in Kenya, we have all these young people who are innovating. Um, and we also have them innovating both positively and negatively because we have a lot of cyber attacks actually coming from young people who, you know, um, young people who are unemployed and are consistently thinking of how they can make money. So they are always thinking of how to break into banks, into, into mobile money, into conning ordinary people. Um, and therefore, the tendency is to respond to that with, um, you know, with, with, a, with a policy that uh, uh, sometimes curtails innovation. And therefore, uh, policymakers need to keep up 
uh, with, with, with the rapidly evolving technologies and um, that ever-changing threat landscape. And the threat of landscape is that today, threats are going to be identified. And once people know that those have been identified, they are consistently uh, thinking of how to, 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 go be, you know, to go behind what has been done to come up with new threats. And so therefore, policymakers need to be above. So they, they, there's, there's need to balance um, that need for innovation uh, with, uh, with securing the digital infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Um, I think, yeah, it's a, it's a really critical point. One of the things that you mentioned, you mentioned a lot of critical points, but I, I was thinking about the need to actually involve the communities and these groups that experience these differentiated impacts and, and have specific needs and, and perceptions around cybersecurity when policy securities are, are actually drafted, but also implemented and evaluated. Um, so in, in the framework that we put together, there are some recommendations in that regard. So I think it's a, it's a key point to have in mind. Thanks so much for sharing uh, about that, Grace. Um, I would like to turn to Jess now, if that's okay. So as I mentioned, we are, we're organizing some regional conversations around this framework. Um, we organized a good session during the Asia Pacific IGF. Um, so participants there highlighted Challenges, for example, in the region related to a shrinking civic space, civic space, challenges for civil society inputs to be taken into account. That challenge, clearly we heard from, from Kemli, um, appears in other regions in the world. Um, and also another thing that, that cam came up in that conversation is cyber-related cyber laws that are ultimately used to censor and, and even criminalize. Um, so, you and your organization have done research and advocacy around those issues uh, in the Philippines context. So I wanted to ask you if you can briefly share um, what were, for example, problems from a gender perspective uh, with cybercrime legislation there in the Philippines. And it could be, I think, useful for all of us if you can share about like, what the strategies you put in place to engage in cyber policy discussions to bring gender and feminist perspectives. Um, so yeah, thanks so much. Fred. Thank you, Veronica, and thank you, firstly, for, for inviting us um, to share our experiences from the Philippines. We also have a national cybersecurity um, stra strategy, uh, national cybersecurity plan, which is actually um, currently in the process of being updated um, this year, so I hope um, we'll have time later so I can also talk about that. But as to the um, cybercrime law, which is another piece of um, legislation that's very crucial and um, impacts um, gender a lot. Um, well, let me start by saying that the cybercrime law of the Philippines actually has a lot of problems. So um, from a human rights perspective in general, um, so we have the criminalization of cyber libel, we have this um, very generic and wide-reaching um, blanket provision that imposes excessive um, penalties to um, crimes that are done um, with the use of ICTs. But one of the most pro problematic provisions, um, especially related to gender, is that the, the law introduced this um, new crime called cyber sex. Um, and it was very broadly defined as uh, the willful engagement, maintenance, control, or operation directly or indirectly of any lascivious exhibition of sexual organs or sexual activity with the aid of a computer system for favor or consideration. So it's, it's a very broad definition and the law didn't um, even define some of the critical terms here, like what's lascivious exhibition, what do we count as sexual organs, what do we count as sexual activity, which you know makes this provision um, prone to arbitrary interpretation of uh, whoever um, is made to interpret it. And so um, that, that brings us a situation where even um, things like consensual acts done online um, or artistic works or works of art or legitimate um, expressions uh, of women and um, LGBTQ um, persons, for example, um, could fall under this um, criminalized um, provision. And 
also considering that the Philippines is still the Philippine society and Philippine culture is still highly patriarchal. We're very predominantly Catholic, so there's still a lot of like, conservative values there. And with this policy being made subject to um, you know, these kinds of moral standards, it really disproportionately endangers um, women, LGBTQ um, persons, and uh, their, their rights to their freedom of expression. Um, the good news is that this uh, this provision has actually been recently, very recently repealed. I think um, early last year. Um, it was not through an amendment of the entire cybercrime law. It was through um, a repealing provision under a new legislation on online sexual abuse and exploitation of children. So it was uh, quite an unconventional route that that it take, and it, it was not it was not ideal, but also. Um, I think we also need to recognize that this was also um, a product of years of advocacy by um, women's rights groups, by LGBTQ um, advocacy groups in the Philippines. Um, and as to the, strat the the second part of your question was on the strategies. So as the strategies that that led to this um, small victory, um, as I consider it. It was, uh, like Kem Lee mentioned earlier, it was really working with the networks. It was a lot of collaboration and coordination um, across different advocacy groups. So um, women's rights groups, for example, children's rights groups, because um, like I said, it was repealed under um, a law on online sexual abuse and exploitation of children. So we, we worked also with children's rights groups, LGBTQ groups. Um, so because, like I said, because the law is uh, very problematic on a lot of different points, we it was also very clear to us um, early on that we had to also attack it from, from different points um, of entry. And it was also fortunate for us to have um, a champion in the Philippine Senate uh, who is a staunch um, advocate of women's rights and um, really like um, re also remains open to, to speaking with um, civil society on, on various issues, including cyber um, policy. So that was um, a thing that I think uh, it was a key point in, in pushing for that um, kind of legislative change. No worries. Uh, thanks so much. Um, just I think that was a key point, the idea of how, well, the idea of forming coalitions and also identifying a champion uh, within the government that could actually be working on cybersecurity specifically or not. Um, so I would like now to, to move to some of the international discussions um, and, and to David, um, because I would like you to share a bit of, of, of how, what's happening at the international level and how do gender considerations appear in, in some multilateral processes on cybersecurity, for example, the UN Open-Ended Working Group on ICTs, um, and what are, if you can share in your view, crucial factors that a gender perspective on international cybersecurity should consider uh, moving forward. So over to you, David, thanks. Great, hi everybody. It's the end of day, it's day three, bottom of the seventh, Nine innings. Okay, we're going to try to, I guess I'll try to capture some salient points. I have speech, but I think given the time, um, I'll probably pretty much dump most of it and I think get to the point. Uh, Canada has long supported gender, gender issues at the international level. It's a core component of our foreign policy and our foreign international aid policy. So I don't think it goes without any saying that, of course, we support this issue entirely. Uh, this is a base plate to our international policies, whether it be cybercrime, cyber open and working group, and elsewhere. So I don't think uh, I'll spend a lot of time on that, um, despite the fact that I've probably got two pages of notes. None of it's really that relevant. Uh, I think what is really relevant is sort of painting a bit of a canvas of what is going on, because I think what people only see is the final product, right? After the hard, hard. After the negotiations are over and the text is resolved is what you see. What you don't see is what goes on in the mean, in between, in the interim period behind the closed doors where countries like Canada and like-minded are fighting for inclusion of specific language that I think we would all agree with. Uh, and there are a cast of countries which I won't bother naming. I'm sure you can figure out who they are. 
um, are doing for their own legit, for their own purposes, uh, have an alternative narrative that they're pushing. This is a constant fight. It is not going away, and I would argue in some uh, cases we're backsliding. Uh, I do cover lots of UN agencies. I sit in Geneva, so including the Human Rights Council, where this is often a front and center element um, to many negotiations. This is just more of a clarion call to repeat that we are not necessarily, the, war, the we are winning battles, but the war is not over. And I think it's in critical importance that we continue to frame our activities in a rights-respecting manner. Uh, the OEWG itself has a norm, Norm E, which says that you know, you know, countries must respect in the uses of cyberspace, basic international frameworks, including um, UDHR. Some countries, as we know, don't necessarily respect the inter they may respect the principles and say that they respect the framework, but their implementation uh, of those rights are not the same. So this, this is an important message. I think that's probably one of the most important messages I can convey. Uh, we are seeing backsliding on SOGI language. We are seeing efforts by some countries to reframe how we talk about rights away from individual rights to people-centric rights, which we know is a crafty way of uh, reducing the role of the individual and upplaying the role of the state. Um, these are, uh, unfortunately, um, traps that some people fall into because what starts to happen is that uh, these languages are brought to different uh, forums, they're brought in different ways, and some of the people in the meetings aren't necessarily as imbued with uh, the human rights um, expertise as in other places. And so we see this in places I cover the ITU, which is also a fascinating place if you want to spend a few hours. Uh, we see, you know, one would think standards are not necessarily political, but we do find Sometimes we get wrapped around the axle fighting over uh, gender language. I've been up till midnight, two in the morning, fighting about inclusion on gender language in a technical standard negotiation. It, it's not pleasant, uh, but it's necessary. And so I don't really want to spend time with the notes because I don't think that's really what's relevant. I think it's really to reinforce to this community that, of course, uh, Canada, but in person, you know, we are in the room, we are fighting, but we need support. I think we need to continue to raise our voices to those who disagree. I think we need to be sophisticated. Um, there is also a trend, of course, of overemphasizing gender, and that, in fact, uh, has a strategic negative effect. So it's being smart, it's being nuanced, and it's being appropriate to where we want to push it, but I think we just need to keep pushing. Uh, this is not going to go away, and frankly, as we all see, cyber digital tech is becoming much more front and center in, in international uh, geopolitics, geostrategic competition. And so I think there is a new uh, demographic of, of uh, fora that are not necessarily well imbued with the human rights understandings that other fora like the Human Rights Council and others have a much more sort of mature conversation and, and folks who understand the issues. So it's imperative that we support the technical community. It's imperative that we support the civil society and member states to the extent that we can uh, to understand why we need to make sure that, the, that there's no backsliding and that we reinforce the existing international human rights frameworks. I think that's more important than probably what somebody from Ottawa sent me yesterday. I will stop there. Thanks for that, David. And well, we just were talking about the need for to identify champions, um, and and Canada has been yeah pushing for the inclusion of this type of language in negotiations, and also being a key ally in terms of civil society participation in some of these international processes, and how important it is to have the groups, as Grace and others were saying, affected by these operations in a differentiated way, like in the discussion too, uh, or the organization that we try to bring these perspectives. Uh, there. So thanks for that. Um, I wanted now, I have a couple of questions. Uh, I don't know if we can technically showcase them there instead of seeing my face uh, at that size. Um, so yeah, I have a couple of questions for the speakers, but also in the case somebody wants to jump in from the audience or, or physical or online audience, um, because I wanted to quickly hear your thoughts also on main challenges. Um, Jess, you mentioned some of them, but Kemli too, but so main challenges you have faced or you consider you could face when advocating for gender intersectional perspectives in cyber policy. Um, also, any thoughts on how a tool like this, this framework could 
provide some support for different stakeholders in integrating a gender perspective into cybersecurity policy and norms. Um, and also, what else? O sea, like what resources, support do you think you need to champion gender in cybersecurity policy in your work? Um, any specific resources or guidance uh, that you think could be helpful? Um, just wanted to open the floor to see if there are any thoughts on that um, from the audience, but also I would like to, to hear from the speakers. So I see a hand there. Do you want to jump in? Um, yeah. Can you, Kemli, can you pass the mic to the colleague? Thank you. Um, thank you so much. My name is Imad Karim from UN Women Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific. Um, and I have three quick questions. The first one, which I also noticed here during IGF, that the conversation with private sector and tech companies is very gender blind. And it's most of the time it's very generalizing all users in one basket or take a global perspective or the focus is just on the minors but women and girls are excluded, but other, um, other genders are also not part of that design. And I wonder if you have any strategies or like ways of how can we change that conversation and make them a little bit gender sensitive and include gender in the design itself of their platform. Um, second question is related to um, inclusion of the cybersecurity agenda in the national action plans. And I wonder if any of you have had that experience within the national context with national action plan and what are the elements of the um, a woman cybersecurity agenda could be included there. And last question is more for like David on those nuances in between, you know, the, the dark side before the text is finalized, and I wonder what are the main issues that usually gets the pushback against this inclusion of a gender language in the, in the final text? Like, and what do you think is, where, where is this coming from, and how can we, uh, from civil society and the UN, uh, can help in eliminating some of those uh, concerns for inclusion? Thanks. Um, great question. Thanks so much for that. Uh, I see Angela's hand. Um, do you want to jump in? And then we try to address or, or distribute the question. Please go ahead. Uh, for me, I, I wanted to attempt question three on what can we do to bring the gender agenda in the cybersecurity space and also to respond to your questions and concerns because I have the same concerns. And this is something I've spoke to with Grace that um, we need to have research on the gendered impacts of cyber, cyber crime. Uh, because the reason the companies are so blind is because they're treating it as a neutral issue, as an issue that affects everyone the same way. But we both know that it is disproportionate disproportionately affects uh, women, minorities, and sexual minorities. So even just thinking about what kind of data uh, KSATs have on uh, complaints they, receives, they receive on cybersecurity could give us very helpful insights on the forms of attack that most women and maybe sexual minorities get the impacts in terms of even monetary and uh, mental, so that they can enrich the policy decisions that are made. So I think that's my contribution to that question. Thanks so much, Angela, for the, um, for the contribution and, and the response to the colleague here. Um, shall we, Kemli, do you want to address some of the questions? And then, yeah, I don't know if somebody else wants to jump in and then We'll go to, to David if you want to address the comment. Um, Kemli? What do you prefer? No, Kemli, go ahead, please. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to address the first question. For me, it's my passion, to be honest. <laughs> um, because um, I, I have been working uh, for, I don't know, 14 years now. Uh, in the creation, in the, in the issue of gender and, and technology, yes? And uh, I have to say that we have um, switched a lot the focus of the work that we are doing there, okay? Because, and, and uh, I, I, I wanted to say this is really, I think, really important, yes? Because 
you know, at, at the beginning, we began um, with this idea of uh, integrating more women in the IT sector, yes, and um, uh, do um, capacity training for them to be integrated in the sector and to have um, opportunities uh, of jobs in this sector, in the IT sector, because it's, a, a, it's, a, it's really a sector of opportunities, yes? Um, and I think this is good, yes, but it's not enough, yes. More and more, we have now in Latin America, I have, I have done for UNESCO a mapping of all the initiatives to attract women to the IT sector and to integrate women in the IT sector, and there is a lot. But at least in our region, the percentage 20%, 80% haven't changed in 15 years, yes? It haven't changed at all. Even with all this effort and it, all its investment, it hasn't changed a lot, yes? And I think, and I think this is because the, I think, no, my, I, I want to say, <laughs> this is because this IT sector is very expulsive of the diverse. And the condition for women studying and working in the IT sector are hard, yes? Then in one point we decide we are going, instead of continue doing that, others are doing, and we think is part of the economical rights of the women, we are going to, we are working very much more in creating a women leadership for the IT sector, yes? Creating a women, a women leadership, an analytical women leadership, understanding their own conditions, and this is connected with the cybersecurity, what means to be part of this society as women and we, women in the IT sector, how we can contribute to the fighting of the women in general. And this is where I connect with the third question, yes? Is this solidarity, sororidad as we call in Spanish, yes? Where we have to connect the, the process of getting this lead, women leadership, yes? To reflect on cybersecurity from this really analytical and collective action of women in IT, supporting women. Then for us, this is the strategy of, of, of women. Uh, we, we think it's very crucial that women uh, work and study ITs. But the problem is that we have a lot of evidence because we have done a lot of research, a, a, a participatory research with them about this condition where they work and they study, yes? And that we have to change also. For us, this is part of, of the violence against women, uh, some violence against women that we haven't integrate, integrate in the discussion around violence against women. Then, this is, this is my question. A big leadership of women in IT supporting the women agenda including cybersecurity. And just to finish, we understand cybersecurity as the right of the people to have a safe space on the digital world as they need a safe space in their neighborhood. Yes, then this is the, fo the, the way that we are focus focused on. Thank you for the question. Uh, just do you want to quick address some of the questions, then I'll try to go to David so we don't forget that question about the push back in international negotiation, and there is one another one question. Um, go ahead briefly. Yes, very briefly, because it's also related to what Kemli said, and um, I was thinking about this based on the questions that you posed, but it might also address your concern, and I really think that we have to go back and reevaluate our concepts of security um, because unless this is, like you said, um, how we frame security issues now is still very highly masculinized, um, you know, and um, unless this kind of thinking is addressed, everything that we would do, uh, even if we push for policy changes, even if we um, encourage women to go into tech and um, ICT sector um, or the cybersecurity sector, that 
all of those will just be stopgap measures. You know, um, we will all like a new policy will come in and it will regress to the same traditional frameworks that we're used to, um, and all of that. Um, so, and this is what I also like the most about the the APC framework, which is um, it highlights the the need to really go back to our the ways that we think about security, and um, through that then we will be able to change policy, change the frameworks, change the institutions and the, the structures that are um, you know, already very deeply ingrained in, in the security sectors now um, and change you know, the, at, the attitudes of the actors as well. So people in government, even people from businesses and um, um, the private sector. Um, so I think that's really where we need to start. Thanks so much for that, Jess. Um, David, do you want to jump in on the question about discussions? Oh, yeah. All right. A uh, couple things. So it's not just, I'm going to start, this may sound a little bombastic, but um, it's not just women who, who are the front and center. I mean, gender is not a gender-specific term. Um, it's also something that I think, you know, whether you're man, woman, or whatever you want to describe yourself as, uh, it's an effort that everybody has to get behind. So I'd just like to sort of slightly correct the record that uh, even though I'm a man, that doesn't mean I can't be uh, highly supportive of the gender movement. Um, that being said, so the back slide and how we can fight it. I mean, it really, it's an upstream. I, I'd say I would focus on the upstream. So let's take, for instance, uh, the International Telecommunications Union, not a very, uh, let's say, it's, it's an old organization. In fact, it's the oldest organization in the UN. Um, it's not, it's very technical, so human rights is not a, something that comes up as an idea front in mind uh, for many of these uh, highly technical engineers and so on and so forth. So it's really education. Um, but of course the, their demographic and the pools of, of interactions and stakeholders they, they deal with are, are not the same you know, in the human rights world or, or otherwise. And so there is a sort of uh, reaching across the, the hallway and reaching out, uh, which is not is partly our job, but also I think from a civil society. It's, 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 so it's just a sort of like uh, we say in French, les deux solitudes, there's the two solitudes, right? There are people who have their demographics and their stakeholders sometimes. It's getting better, but it's not great. Um, a lot of it is simply because member states have certain uh, things that are red lines. It's normal. Uh, we have red lines when we're in negotiations, uh, which are framed around our values and, and our, our policies in the same way. I don't have to agree with them. And so the fight is about trying to find, obviously, the UN works on consensus, which, just to remind, is not unanimity, but consensus tends to focus on getting everybody to agree. And, and so sometimes uh, some countries or blocks will hold out on something of substance uh, because the gender language is something they don't like. Um, sometimes it's a change, sometimes it's, it's a, uh, to have it extracted. Um, sometimes it's just a useful, because they know it's important to us, it's used as a weapon to con to, for concessions in, in other ways. So that's a bit of the, uh, as they say, pulling back the kimono a bit to reveal what's a little bit what's going on in the background. But I really want to just finish, and I realize we have two minutes left, I see the hand up. Um, I won't name the state, but the Human Rights Council session 54 is currently ongoing. Uh, in one of the item eight debates a few days ago, a state, I won't be named, um, got up and in a statement uh, called for the end of the integration of SOGI language in UN documents um, on the basis that it's not recognized as a legal form of discrimination under international law. Now this state isn't perhaps the one you might think would make this statement. I won't name it, I'm happy to tell you offline, but just to give you an example, it's happening even in the Human Rights Council, it's happening everywhere. We have people who understand these debates in the Human Rights Council and so can defend our values, our values, uh, can defend the human international human rights framework, but that doesn't necessarily mean at an IEEE meeting or at the IETF or at the ITU that those same expertise exist. And so that's where the civil society and I think stakeholders who are more educated um, need to work with and help those who don't. Thanks, David, uh, for that. And I am aware of the time, but I want to give the opportunity to jump in. And there is another ticket you have your hand. Okay, let's do that, and and then I can I can 
Try to wrap up, please. I can, I can also talk about this after this session, but my name is Farzana Baidi. Uh, uh, from Digital Medusa. Uh, so uh, we, ha we are doing this research for uh, USAID and they are looking at what human-centered approaches to digital transformation. And one of the uh, strategies that they, they have is cybersecurity uh, to kind of incorporate cybersecurity in digital transformation. And I was wondering if uh, you know of any kind of like gender uh, framework that can help uh, with these development or uh, organizations that help with uh, digital transformation to consider uh, gender as a factor uh, when uh, they uh, want to have uh, cybersecurity in place and uh, like kind of like help from the beginning uh, instead of uh, doing things uh, after the technology is in place. Thanks for that question. Um, I know we have to f finish the session. It's okay. Do you want? I I encourage you all to continue the conversation after the session ends. Um, we can, in fact, touch base uh, because we have some recommendations in the framework about how to link this agenda to other agendas. To, for example, the um, the agenda for sustainable development, also to digital economy indicators. So. Connected those with broader arguments could be as useful, in, in, for example, for a digital transformation strategy discussion. But we can continue uh, the conversation after the session. I don't know, Grace, I want to give you the opportunity to say something before we close, if you, if you want to. No, okay. Thank you uh, for being mindful of the time. And thank you all for the, for the discussions. Uh, there are a lot of great points that need to continue Look, to keep pushing for this, also to produce more research, more evidence, uh, and, and the importance of continue creating awareness and rethinking the concept of security, as Jess was saying. So thanks so much. R please reach out to APC if you want to stay in touch, and enjoy the rest of the IGF. <laughs> Bye.